In April 2007, someone took a photograph of a sea dragon in Tasmania. It's a male sea dragon, and we later named him Speedy. He's already an adult in this photograph, and you can tell from the mottled skin on the underside of his tail that he's recently carried a brood of eggs. You see, in sea dragons, it's the males who are left holding the babies. In our database, we don't see Speedy again for over two years. And then here he is in November 2009, sporting a beautiful fresh batch of eggs on his tail. After this, we see Speedy more than 300 times in a series of images leading until today. We know what this sea dragon's been up to. But a single individual cannot represent a population. And a population cannot represent a species, especially if they're found over a wide geographic range. So how do we gather enough data to understand sea dragons better? And how do we use that data to protect and manage them better? There are three species of sea dragons found in Australia, and only in Australia. Here be dragons. The two shallow water species, which are encountered by divers and snorkelers, uh, and there's a third species that is just found in deeper water. The distribution of the most widespread species, which is the common or weedy sea dragon, matches the length of the newly recognised Great Southern Reef. This important ecosystem covers more than 8,000 kilometres of Australia's temperate coastline, and it's under direct threat from climate change, development and pollution. The leafy sea dragon is found in a smaller part of this same area, and the ruby sea dragon is still only known from Western Australia. The important thing is that we care about sea dragons, right? This is why I'm doing this kind of work. And what we're interested in is how to understand those sea dragons better. The two shallow water species of sea dragons are currently listed as least concern on the conservation of nature's red list. The red list can guide scientific research to address knowledge gaps, to inform policy and conservation planning, and to assist with raising awareness. So red listing can be a really powerful way to catalyse action when it comes to changing conservation policy. But the kind of information that we need to assess that extinction risk isn't available. How many individuals are there? Are the populations stable or declining? What's the age structure of those populations? Where do they occur? This kind of information will help us figure out which category of red list that they should fall into. But obtaining this kind of information across scales as large as Australia's temperate coastline is a pretty daunting task. And just wait until you see how easy they are to find underwater. Sea dragons are masters of camouflage. The incredible adaptations that they show to blend in with their environment are very effective, especially against the eyes of divers. Even if someone's directing you to look at one right in the centre of your field of view, it can take a while before your eyes see what they're seeing. And this causes some very real problems for scientists that are trying to understand these fish. The most effective way to gather the kind of information we need is to do something called a mark recapture survey, where we try and refind animals that we've seen earlier. Sea dragons tend to stay in the same place their whole life, and the proportion of recited animals, which is shown in that overlap area between those two circles, helps us model and estimate the total number of animals in the population. If we were to do this by traditional means, we might put on a, a physical tag onto the animal. But this can be distressing to the individual. It's expensive. 
and it's time consuming. So it's not a very effective option if we're trying to scale up across vast distances. Fortunately, sea dragons have patterns on their face and body that are unique to each individual, like a fingerprint. We can take advantage of advances in technology like machine learning and facial recognition and track these animals digitally instead without laying a hand on them. It's easier, it's less costly, and it's better for the animals that we're trying to protect. So how would this method work? The first step is to train an algorithm to tell the difference between sea dragon and background when faced with an image like this. If we were to go on a dive and take a photo like one of these, we'd be interested to see if that dragon had been seen before. So we'd first run this detection pipeline and identify sea dragon, and then we would run an algorithm called Hotspotter, which will look inside that area, in that box, and examine the patterns and spots and create what we call a visual texture score. Sea Dragon Search, our platform, which helps us manage the data, will then look in the database and select other images that have similar visual texture scores. And in this way, it creates a kind of checklist for us to go through and look for resites. And what would a resite look like? A little bit like this. <laughs> so here, you can tell that the highlighted spots on the Sea Dragon faces are the same in each image. And so we can be pretty confident that this is the same individual sea dragon photographed at different times. If we didn't have a rematch, it would look something like this, where there's no confidence that those spots are the same. And you can see just with your eyes that they're quite different looking animals. But in this case, we would take that query image. If we didn't get a rematch, we would call it a new dragon for the database. So both rematches and new dragons are critical for estimating that total number in the population. So that's how the method works. But then how do we get enough photographs of sea dragons to make this work? With your help, we have made significant progress. By asking the public and you all to contribute images, we have made amazing progress. The other thing we've learned is how amazing people can be. The diversity of participants in our project is amazing. And the lengths that some of these people will go to to help these fish has just exceeded our wildest dreams. There are kids as young as 11 snorkeling at their local beaches. There are folks as old as, well, let's just say I hope to still be diving when I'm their age. <laughs> there are people who carry out their own tracking projects on their local dragons using Sea Dragon Search as a tool. There are dive professionals like instructors and underwater photographers that use their extensive time in the water to help out the project. There are science communicators that contribute their skills. There are even people that just had to buy an underwater scooter so that they could survey a greater area. True. <laughs> there are people that sometimes snorkel nearly daily to document the rapid changes that take place when juveniles are developing. There's even relationships that are formed between participants. So I am still holding out for a, an invite to a sea dragon themed wedding one day. One day. These people fit in these surveys around their busy lives. And they're doing surveys, right? They're doing science. And they're contributing this data because they care. In early 2022, I wanted to take a trip to go and visit Speedy in his home in Tasmania. But if you recall, 
Tasmania opened its borders in December 21. And things got a little complicated and I had to cancel my trip. And I was feeling a little pessimistic and I was thinking about Speedy's age and whether he'd still be there when I was able to go. But that year, I was managing data on the platform. I was watching videos of Speedy and converting them into still images to process. And I felt like I got to know Speedy a little better. I knew where he hung out. I knew the sounds that he heard every day. And I knew that the water got cold, but crystal clear as winter approached. I waited, and I waited for my opportunity. And then, in March, Speedy vanished. His long-term friend and photographer kept in touch with me, and we knew that Speedy had never been missing from his little home patch for more than a couple of weeks. So after two months had gone by, I was devastated. I thought I'd missed my chance. I cursed COVID. It was really sad. And then, towards June, he came back. Who knows where he had been that whole time? I guess even sea dragons have their secrets. Earlier this year, I was able to take a short vacation and visit Speedy in his home. And it was amazing. I recognised the surrounds, and I remember the clinking that those anchor chains made. It was all familiar, and he was my little friend. I felt really honoured to be in his presence. So where's Speedy now? Well, here is an image taken just one or two months ago of Speedy, 16 years after that first image that I showed you. Speedy is now the oldest known living wild sea dragon. In the scientific literature, there are no direct measurements of longevity, although a couple of methods estimate six to 10 year lifespans. But Speedy, at 16 years and doing just fine, thanks, <laughs> is helping us learn more every day. People are so empowered when they're able to participate in the scientific research that achieves the things that they want, like better protection for sea dragons. And scientists, I can speak from personal experience, feel really motivated when they're supported by a community that shares their vision. And stepping towards those goals together, each sharing their knowledge along the way, makes for a really powerful approach. Breaking down those artificial barriers between the public and scientists is necessary if we want to achieve effective conservation together. So, maybe now you want to learn to scuba dive. Maybe you'd like to take underwater photographs of sea dragons or just comb the beaches where they live. You are all most welcome to join Sea Dragon Search and follow along with our progress. But if that's not for you, think about what you care about the most and get involved. You might be surprised at how valuable your contribution can be and how much scientists and fish like Speedy might be grateful for your help. Thank you.